Bienvenidos a El Alef, Festival de Arte y Ciencia. Hoy contamos con la presencia de las doctoras australianas Helen O'Connell y Caroline de Costa, quienes tendrán la charla Clitoridectomía Crítica y el Auge de la Clitorización. La doctora Helen O'Connell es uróloga y profesora en la Universidad de Melbourne, Australia. Su trabajo ha sido sustancial en la investigación con respecto a la anatomía del clítoris, un tema ignorado, menospreciado y tergiversado por muchos anatomistas y médicos durante siglos. Es reconocida por ser la primera uróloga australiana que logró describir con gran exactitud las partes del clítoris, su tamaño, su relación con la uretra y la vagina. Por su cuenta, Caroline de Costa es profesora de obstetricia y ginecología, así como editora de la revista de obstetricia y ginecología de Australia y Nueva Zelanda. Durante sus investigaciones, de Costa ha observado una falta casi total de la mención del clítoris en la literatura obstétrica y ginecológica actual. Cabe destacar que de Costa invitó a O'Connell a escribir un artículo para la edición de octubre de 2020 de su revista sobre la ausencia de la mención del clítoris en la literatura obstétrica y ginecológica. Ahora se une a ella para discutir el tema con mayor profundidad. Bienvenidas Helen y Caroline, es un honor contar con su presencia. Adelante. Hello, I'm Professor Helen O'Connell, a urolog urological surgeon and professor of surgery at the University of Melbourne. Uh, I'm Caroline de Costa and I've been professor of obstetrics and gynecology for the past 17 years at James Cook University. Uh, in Cairns in Northern Australia. I am the editor of the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, also known as ANSJOG. And last year I invited Professor O'Connell to write an editorial about the clitoris based on her groundbreaking research into the anatomy and physiology of the organ. And because I'd observed over some time that the clitoris is practically never mentioned Uh, by obstetricians and gynecologists or referred to in our journals, even though it's located right in the middle of where we work. Uh, we note that the LLF conference aims to bring together science and the humanities. And this seems a very appropriate place for our discussion today. Here we have a scientific conundrum the complete neglect of a very significant part of female anatomy. And that neglect has come about for societal reasons. How can this situation be resolved? Well, it's my privilege now to interview Helen O'Connell about this very important topic. Helen, you studied medicine at the University of Melbourne and you graduated in 1985 as a doctor. At what point did you start to think of becoming a surgeon? Were there any role models for you at the time? Yeah, when I was um, little, mum encouraged us culturally, I guess, to do the hard thing and sort of the right thing rather than, you know, anything, if you like. Um, she also made me aware of Dr. Catherine Hanlon, who's a very famous Australian uh, gynecological surgeon who started a fistula hospital in Ethiopia with her husband. And so I found, you know, there was quite a lot of gravitas in what she'd done and, and the attitude to that work. So I found that inspiring. But there were uh, no female surgical role models, really, Uh, or very few anyway. Um, however, I did have a fabulous role model um, in Professor Lorraine Denistein. So she was a pioneer of women's health. Um, by training initially a, a general practitioner who became aware that there was a real deficiency of um, uh, intellectual substance to support the care of women who had premenstrual tension and other female conditions. Um, so her PhD was on um, affect, sexuality and hormones 
And she became a really great role model for me as my Master of Medicine supervisor in 1989. And then you were attracted to the surgical specialty of urology, which at the time was a very male uh, profession. Uh, what drew you to, re to urology? As it turns out, um, when I became a trainee in, in urology in 1991, I was the first um, Australian female to train in urology, uh, which I wasn't nice. fully aware of at the time. Um, I did want to do surgery. Um, Mum had sort of fussed about my hands, said, you know, one day you'll do something great with those hands. <laughs> and... Um, and then I had this odd situation where I wanted to do surgery and hadn't really decided what branch it would be. And then I'm in an outpatient clinic and a patient says to me, it's so great to talk to a woman. And that made me think, oh, wow, there may be an advantage to being a female in the specialty of urology where so much of it just looked so hard this was actually a real positive so you trained in general surgery and then in neurology so as a clinician and your first postgraduate qualifications were in that direction you got a fellowship of the royal australasian college of surgeons uh, which was hard enough but then you began an academic career as well what uh, drew you to further study yeah, I, um, maybe I'm a glutton for punishment, <laughs> Caroline, but um, it did appear when I was studying for um, my surgical exams that there was truly a problem with anatomy. Uh, so our textbook, well, firstly, we had learnt about human sexuality in our um, psychiatry lectures. So I knew something about the clitoris through psychiatry and sexuality. But then we're studying for the exams and the book actually had nothing or almost completely nothing. And certainly in the images that should have had a clitoris, there was nothing. Um, and I had to study this book laboriously. And so over and over, every time I'd look at it, I would get crosser and crosser at what was omitted. Um, so firstly, there was the problem of omission. There was also this situation where um, it would describe the male anatomy as normal and the female anatomy as a departure from that. Yes. And in fact, the only organ that seemed to get a reasonably good run in anatomy was the uterus but it did really appear to be a social problem uh, that this intellectual substance was treated so badly. Yes, so the uterus is there for motherhood. Well, it did seem like you know, that was an organ you were going to learn about well, yes. but these other body parts, you know, nerves to, the, to even the vagina or, or the clitoris were completely not described. Uh, and I might mention just here that um, along with all this work, academic and clinical, you also had a family. Yes, I, I was very blessed, I believe, as you were, to have had, um, well, I two great kids. They're, they're now grown-ups. Um, but, yeah, it is a blessing to have had that Absolutely. alongside a career, actually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So tell me now about how you came really on the subject of the clitoris um, and in particular your discovery that the full anatomy was unknown not only to the general public but uh, to doctors. Yeah so there I am studying for my surgical exams and I can see this deficiency that I alluded to earlier. So there's this terrible lack of information about an organ that I know as a young woman is an important organ. And then um, I start, uh, so I was exposed to alternate views of anatomy as though there could be views of anatomy. Come on, this is the human body. There aren't views. It really is 
the facts. way it is or not. You know, facts, facts, facts. Yeah. hard, and not false ones, hard yeah. science, and not not false ones. And so, I was um, exposed to uh, some feminist literature, which had a view. It was called a new view of a woman's body, and they'd said, well, uh, in the forward, ideally, we would have had um, access to cadavers for this research and I sort of tucked away in my head at some stage I'll need to um, study that anatomy but then as a young uh, urology uh, trainee a surgeon in the making it was clear that we were learning how to um, remove the prostate in such a way that we would preserve the male nerves very carefully and there was this um, real value on those male nerves and um, what they subserved in terms of function. Yes. So, so male sexual function was very important. Very important. Mm -hmm. and, and that if you had the anatomy right, you could then get the surgery right. Mm -hmm. And so it did make me wonder whether similar work had been done in women. Um, I did then... Um, set up a doctoral program with Professor John Hudson, looking specifically in the first instance at the nerves. And it was very interesting, just at the most basic level, and I'll show you some images later to, to um, add some uh, an image to this um, context, but um, Gray's anatomy, which was sort of the Bible that we all banked on for giving us the true, the truth about anatomy, gave a full description of the penile nerves, the dorsal penile nerves, and then about the female equivalent said just the statement, the corresponding female nerves are the same, only they're very small. And actually... Yeah. Yeah. It, it was so there was a sort of hierarchy yes. and and both things proved to be completely false mm -hmm. so the nerves are not small and then what is the path to those nerves we absolutely have to have that spelled out because through that path is a great opportunity for injury if not known yes by gynecologists yeah. well potentially gynecologists but it could also be urologists, general surgeons, colorectal surgeons, pelvic trauma. If you don't know the anatomy, mm. how can you protect it consciously? Exactly. Oh, so you've unearthed some pretty amazing facts and descriptions of clitoris from supposedly learned. I might have this one. Yes. And <laughs> one I prepared for you earlier, Doctor. <laughs> uh, and so tell me a bit about what you found when you looked at the literature. So um, uh, historically, um, uh, what, what has been said about the clitoris in the past? Um, yeah, so it, it, in reviewing the literature extensively, as I did for my doctorate, it was clear that amongst a lot of really suboptimal descriptions, you know, the little penis kind of view and um, or the true absence, that there were actually some very accurate anatomies. Of course, I didn't, I was studying the anatomy to work out what was accurate. But when we delved into it, there had been some really great historical descriptions. Of course, they didn't have the benefit as we did of uh, really objective media like photography, um, digital imaging, MRI, all the modern uh, technology we could bring to uh, making anatomy incontestable, which is kind of an exciting time to be reviewing anatomy in a way. Um, and so the other really interesting thing that had happened about anatomy that some psychologists um, became aware of, talked about um, in an article by Moore and Clark in um, the mid nineties, was that anatomy of the clitoris was actually well described in a version of Gray's anatomy at the beginning of the 20th century, 
only to lose detail, how could that happen, across the 20th century? So you've got successive editions where they've, someone's decided or it's just, you know, maybe there's too much detail, what can we drop off? Oh, well, that doesn't matter. Whatever it was I that underpinned <laughs> possibly but maybe a woman anyway someone had decided that less detail was required and it wasn't until the 1970s that actually um, more detail of the clitoris became um, evident in these successive versions of Gray's Anatomy so um an amazing thing that you can actually have active deletion of description across a time period of observation. Even though the clitoris is still there. It, it, even though truly women are not changing no, uh, right. over that period of time. So yeah, it's fundamentally uh, kind of yeah. amazing. Helen, would you maybe just demonstrate for uh, our audience. Oh, yes. The major parts of the uh, clitoris. So um, I might start off with, before we go into detail about our little model. Um, not uh, so little. No, not, not, not so little. In fact, if you, this is a life-size model taken from um, a 3D of MRI and so you see that the clitoris sort of fits into the palm of your hand is the best I can come up with in terms of relating it to someone who's a non-anatomist. Um, but just to give you an overview, we see that uh, at the top of the screen and so the image shows uh, where the top of the pubic bone is, which is where the um, glands or tip of the clitoris um, extends upwards to the body of the clitoris, which sits underneath, directly underneath the pubic bone. And, uh, and then you'll see um, the anus is um, depicted the urethra is the female urine passage and the clitoris, which is in that um, lilac or pale purple colour, is, um, is highlighted and you see its various parts. So I might go through that with our little model. So um, this is a model created by Dr. E. Mulligan, who is a medical doctor who is... Um, uh, very interested in uh, education and, and backfilling um, people's understanding of this organ in particular because she feels it's um, so deficient. Um, but I will get a little bit closer to the, the camera to show you. So these components are the crura that run along, I might have the um, pelvic um, bone. This is the way the organ fits underneath the pelvis. So this, and is, this is the part that is most familiar to the, so the, the glands the is the tiny bit that's apparent if you like, people have conceptualised the tip of the iceberg because this is the only bit that's visible when you look at uh, the vulva or the skin that wraps over the top of the clitoris. And so this is the boomerang, if we have it in the correct anatomical position, this is the boomerang shaped um, body of the clitoris. So these two arms, the crura join together to form the body that sits underneath the pubic bone. And then we have on either side of the lower vagina and uh, urethra, and you'll have a look at that through some art later to understand that relationship better. But these are the bulbs of the clitoris and each of these four bodies 
um, unites up here. And there is actually another little area between the skin and that area called the pars intermedia where all of the blood vessel communications um, make sure that these parts are all interconnected. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of what the clitoris looks like. So Helen, you uh, did a lot of dissection mm. in your preparations for your research and mm. your, your doctorate and also you used MRI. Well, actually, the, the MRI story was um, fantastic, actually. So my mentor, uh, who uh, sadly for us passed away recently, Dr. Ed McGuire, at age 81, was a doyen of a, a new specialty, female urology. He had a chance conversation at the University of Michigan with a guru of gynaecology and anatomy in particular, uh, Dr. John Delancey. John had done quite a lot of MRI study. By the time he contacted me, he had a bank of 200 MRI images, but he also had this small bank of 10 um, healthy volunteer MRIs. And so he contacted me and said, we think we can see the clitoris in these MRIs. Um, you've been studying it. Would you like to collaborate? And, you know, would I? Yes, <laughs> I yes. would very much <laughs> like to. And so you can now have a look at this image of the MRI of the clitoris. So one of the things is uh, normal non-doctors have a bit of trouble looking at dissections. And so I could show you you know, a vast array of dissections. But one thing is moving this into models. Another is MRI, which um, is a modality where uh, there's no distortion related to the imaging itself uh, that can happen possibly with uh, ultrasound. Um, but it shows very clearly, if you look at this MRI, the urethra is in the center as a little target shaped uh, organ. The vaginal wall in cross section is immediately behind it. And then a little bit further behind is the anus. But up towards the top um, in a, a much lighter color owing to its vascularity is vascularity. the is vascularity, yeah. its blood supply, which is high is the clitoris. And so you can see this uh, pyramidal shaped structure with that core of the lower vagina and urethra. And so it's absolutely incontrovertible um, anatomy evidence. And then you'll see in the next image, uh, we have a little diagram to translate it more easily from the photograph of the MRI image. And we have each of the um, clitoral parts uh, labeled um, with the nerves as they come off the pelvic sidewall. And what's really interesting as well about the nerves, you know, Gray said they were small, yes. or in fact, very small. They are not very small. And, and in fact, they've been studied by um, a number of investigators now. And so they're between two and four millimetres in diameter, which for any nerve is a large, large. nerve. Um, and, and so these are nerves that only go, so they're the terminal divisions of the pudendal nerves, these large nerves that only go to the clitoris. Yes. And are totally relevant to sexual function. Yeah, exactly. Um, the other thing uh, I might draw attention to at the moment is just we've talked about the model uh, is the importance of artwork. So we just saw a diagram. Um, and uh, we have a, a lovely image or a couple of images from TV art. This is from a documentary 
created in France from uh, Arte um, in about 2003, which was picked up by SBS Australia. And you see how wonderfully art lends itself to understanding conceptually uh, what anatomy is like. Yes. Um, and so you can see in one view what the clitoris looks like and then from an oblique view, a different view. Exactly, yes. Um, when you first began to report your findings um, uh, academically, Helen, what were the initial reactions? This is towards the end of the 1990s. Well, it was <laughs> amazing, actually. So. New scientists picked up the story before we published and um, they actually ran an article about it. Yes. And as a result, uh, the phone just ran red hot <laughs> because maybe it was just that people were ready for this to come alive. Um, but uh, we couldn't keep up with the, the press uh, related to it. So uh, the, it was just... Firstly, incredibly well supported by academic peers and, and actually superiors at that time of my career. Um, and then we had all this uh, excitement in the popular press. Yes. Um, so it was a, a very interesting moment, actually. And, and it did show just the power of the media to communicate um, cold hard science such as anatomy yes and so there was a lot of interest from women yeah. so profound interest from women and um but, but very interestingly how how interested the um our colleagues were as well um uh, you know it did attract um a suitable scholarship funding um from uh, highly reputable organisations. So, uh, yeah, institutions. It was um, it was terrific. Uh, so that's all been very encouraging. Uh, yeah, but enough about my work, uh, Caroline. But thank you for your generous oh. <laughs> listening, um, Professor De Costa. You, you've had a stellar career and, and made so much difference. Um, I'm so pleased you reached out. Um, with the invitation to do the editorial for Anne's Jog. Um, and I'd had my own obstacles, but um, you were in fact tackling um, doing an obstetric career at a much earlier stage. Can you share us some, some of the stories of what it was like to become a young um, gynaecology trainee and, and what, what was it like at that stage? Uh, yes, well, I was... I brought, brought up in Australia, but um, I didn't study medicine here. I travelled and worked for a while before I uh, began medicine in Ireland, in Dublin, uh, in the late 60s, 1960s and um, early 1970s. I became involved in the women's liberation movement in Ireland very quickly uh, once I realised that the situation for women in Ireland was dire at that time. There was no contraception certainly no abortion, no divorce. And as a medical student, I saw women who lived in poverty uh, because they had a pregnancy every year, resulting in families of 10, 12, 14 children. Wow. Um, and I was part of a group of women who in 1971, uh, very publicly, we took a train. It was possible to get the train from Dublin in the south of Ireland where contraception was not available and go to Belfast in the north, which is in the United Kingdom where it was possible to uh, buy contraceptives. So we loaded, we went up on the train and came back in the same day, uh, loaded ourselves up with condoms, and we brought them back to Dublin with as much noise and con commotion as we possibly could, gaining the attention of the Irish customs officers, but also media attention. And this was part of the start of the campaign to get contraception for Irish women. Um, it also involved the work of several very courageous doctors, uh, some women, some men, who have been role models for me all my life. Uh, and this, it really led to radical changes over um, several decades in Irish society, which now, Ireland now has legalised divorce, same-sex marriage and abortion, as you probably know. 
Um, I also undertook my specialist training in obstetrics and gynaecology in Ireland, and I was one of the first uh, women to do that um, in the 1970s. Well, what a fabulous um, story. I mean, just amazing uh, life, Caroline. Um, our medical specialties have both been very male dominated. Very male dominated. Yeah. How, how did you navigate being so outnumbered? Did you ever, as they say now, call anyone out on sexist communication or concepts? So as a young woman, I found it, I had to work very hard and seek to be the best um, because uh, I didn't play rugby, which was uh, considered necessary to become an obstetrician gynecologist uh, for males. Um, but I did receive, I have to say, a lot of encouragement and support and teaching from many male colleagues. Uh, I experienced more sexism and discrimination actually later in my career as a specialist in Australia, um, which did have to be called out. I was in a much stronger position to do it mm. um, than I would have been if I had been training here or been a medical student. I was, I was already a consultant. Um, and it was also necessary to encourage and mentor younger women here uh, in Australia to get them into the specialty. It takes another six years after your medical degree to become an obstetrician and gynaecologist as the same length of time for a mm. urologist. Uh, but this has been very successful. Um, more than half the specialists now in obstetrics and gynaecology in Australia are women. And I think the numbers are increasing in surgery too. It's really something to celebrate, the um, rise of the percentage of, yes. of women in uh, obstetrics and gynaecology. And with that change, how... How do you think that actually occurred? What, what, what sort of tactics, if you like, do you think consciously or subconsciously were used by early um, uh, obstetric and gynaecology specialists, women, uh, to bring that about? Yes. Uh, well, I think um, there was determination on the part of all the women who wanted to do it. They wanted to be trained exceptionally well and I think it was to some extent exceptional women who took up the mantle, uh, but we uh, were a group together and we supported each other. Uh, and I think that was very important. Um, we actually had really formal group meetings over a period of time in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, and we had to push to get into training. Of course, it was men who had to let us in and there were men who supported us and did that, um, but it was necessary to be Persistent. Mm. Um, Helen, is there now a definite body of practice that is female urology? Has this happened over the last few decades? Yeah, look, um, it overlaps with the territory called urogynecology. Yes. Um, so urologists tend to look at the urinary tract probably from the kidneys um, ureters, bladder down, but essentially, yes, it, it has um, risen, arisen as its own specialty. And so people like Dr. Ed McGuire uh, have forged this area which uh, complements urogynecology and um, which, which specifically looks after the female urinary tract and, and focuses on very much the best outcome giving value to the female urinary tract rather than um, us being a very prostate-centred organisation, if you like. Uh, so I, um, I began to notice that there was very little mention of, of, of the clitoris in obstetrics and gynaecology. Um, from way back, I guess, um, and I just felt, well, that's how it is and we'll get around to this sometime. We need to get into training. We need to be um, a, a majority or a, a substantial minority uh, within uh, the College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists before we can start getting onto things like, uh, you seem to have forgotten about the clitoris. <laughs> <laughs> Something um, missing here, guys. <laughs> uh, but I certainly realised that the, t the anatomy teaching that I had had uh, as, as a medical student, but then as a trainee in obstetrics and gynaecology, it, um, as Helen has said, 
The parts of the clitoris are described as small and insignificant analogues of the male, which is larger and more prominent. And there's a phallus and it's, this is important. And the adjacent parts are very important. The prostate's very important. Um, women don't have prostates. No. Um, occasionally there's mention in obstetric literature of tears to the clitoris and how they have to be repaired. And there's a, a lot of literature now on the management of female genital mutilation, which is removal of the clitoris and sometimes parts of the labia, um, practiced by certain societies. And as women from those societies have moved, um, have em uh, emigrated um, to Australia, to America, to Europe, uh, there's been more awareness of this amongst obstetricians and gynecologists um, with uh, solutions to um, the, the problem. Uh, so that's you think certainly uh, obstetricians and gynecologists have been committed to assisting the cause of elimination FGM? They, they, yes, they're prepared to look at how to um, uh, ameliorate the situation. At the same time, we are still not taught about the full anatomy, which is demonstrated in, in you know, something as simple as the model. Mm, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, obstetricians and gynecologists have been committed to opposing the practice, speaking out socially, uh, certainly in Australia and I know elsewhere. Uh, but clear information about the anatomy and the physiological functioning of the organ is still strangely absent. So. Eventually, as editor of my journal, I got around to actually doing a short literature search, and this confirmed my general impressions. And that's at the point at which I contacted you and said, we need uh, your input. We need an editorial, please, Helen. Yeah, and it was great to um, formally engage uh, a couple of um, outstanding young women who are doing master's degrees. Um, in a formal literature research. So we did publish it in the ANZ Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, moving from critical, as in cognitive clitoridectomy. So there is this tendency for truly, uh, so the organ was actually injured back um, uh, in the 19th century. So uh, I can talk to you about that if we have time. Um, and certainly there's a cultural practice of mutilating or harming this organ um, and there's complex underpinning uh, social reasons for that. Um, but even when there's no physical harm, there's been an intellectual absence, a critical clitoridectomy, if you like. Um, as we've seen with the anatomy text as we've seen in the absence from gynecology anatomy sections, um, it, it has been actually missing from our intellectual property, if you like. Um, it is exciting to note that um, a current version of uh, the fundamentals of obstetric and gynecology uh, textbook, they have invited me to update their anatomy section. So there is change happening, but this very real thing continues to be an issue. And so there's now a growing movement of something called clitoracy or getting clitorate um, as a way of addressing or backfilling the uh, intellectual and psychological uh, deficits that have affected female sexual knowledge um, obstetric knowledge, gynaecologic, uh, and, and the surgical underpinnings um, that uh, should have been there to serve women. Yes. Well, interestingly, I published that uh, editorial, and it was excellent, in October last year. I received a lot of emails uh, as a result. I received a lot of emails from women uh, who had heard about it because uh, Helen also uh, did an interview with The Guardian uh, on the topic. They were very interested, the media were interested. So I got a lot of um, correspondence from women um, and I got some correspondence from women obstetricians and gynecologists. So far, I haven't received a single letter, message, anything at all from either the, the teaching body, the College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, 
uh, or any of my male colleagues. So there's still a great reticence, I think, amongst some, and they, I have to say, more male colleagues to think about the clitoris uh, and integrate it into our overview of, of female anatomy, female mm. genital anatomy. Yes, there's obviously some change happening, but it's from a pretty low base yes. and, and you know, so it, it sort of needs to be addressed with um, some social change, probably the sort of thing that we're doing right now. Yeah. Plus, but then, yeah, well, that's yes. right, and these yeah. amazing models. Um, but one of the things that we're seeing, and, and you uh, raised this uh, when we started discussing it, is that in the West, it's as though we've got our, our very own type of FGM. And so I'm aware that from embryology, the original tissue that um, becomes a penis in the male um, baby, that tissue in the female baby becomes the clitoris and labia minora. And so in labiaplasty, we're seeing that tissue potentially removed. Do you want to comment on that and what you've seen as a gynecologist? Because this is clearly a practice that's occurring at pretty high rates. And um, what do you think in relation to the FGM movement? Yes, well, I, um, I think this is uh, very concerning. Um, because uh, there are a number of factors coming together. One is that uh, there is a tendency now to uh, remove all pubic hair amongst younger women uh, uh, with Brazilians. And so the vulva, the vulva consisting of the labia majora, which are the larger lips, as you say, on either side of the vaginal canal, uh, and then between them, the labia minora, which as Helen has said, are really an extension of the clitoris. They contain the same kind of sensitive um, tissue which, with a very good blood supply that is part of um, the apparatus for good sexual function in, in a woman. Uh, and uh, they can, they, in almost all women, and there is variety, they are normal. They are anatomically normal, but there are variations. And of course, this is not an area of the body that other people usually see. And it's, uh, it's quite common now for young women to be concerned that their labia are, are abnormal and to present uh, for either confirmation that it's normal, but in particular to request removal of parts of the labia minora in the process of labiaplasty. It's really cosmetic, cosmetic surgery. It is not done by obstetricians and gynaecologists. And as a college, we're very much opposed to it. But I'm not sure that we've been as specific enough about it. Um, and uh, I think it's more, uh, so far, the idea that this is removing a part of the anatomy, but not seeing it as an equivalent of female genital mutilation, which in fact, it really is, because it is removing tissue. Um, if you took similar tissue away from a male, there would be an outcry mm -hmm. immediately. Um, and uh, it's, I think this, the, the fact that this, this tissue does not need to be removed uh, full stop, but also that it is um, really important for good sexual functioning for women needs to be made clearer. Yes, it, it, it's incredible, isn't it, that you can have in a huge number of healthy women. Young women. Young women. The social construct that there's something wrong that needs to be fixed rather than uh, them becoming aware at this age of the pleasure that this organ okay. and, and its associated tissues may bring. Um, and that it's theirs, <laughs> you know, that actually it's being found wanting and, and exposed, you know, by all this hair removal that's become 
kind of almost expected. Absolutely. All of these things are expected. And, you know, the, the fact that women are expected to look like a, a you Barbie know, like doll. a Barbie doll or an infant, mm -hmm. really, um, rather than truly uh, as a woman yes. is it, it, something that, um, so I, I think that this is now falling under a banner that um, people like Sophia Wallace, um, and so it would be worth having a look at her TED talk. Uh, she's um, used the word clitoracy um, or getting clitorate is another concept um, for addressing this um, reversing, um, changing the conversation so that women can have a brighter future. Yes, indeed. Uh, Helen, do you, I think you might have a little bit of time just to, to mention some of the things that happened to the clitoris in the 19th century. Um, yeah. You know, looking at history. It, it is uh, it is a up. fascinating story. So um, we did describe this, and you can delve into it more from the references in that editorial, but Isaac Baker Brown became the president of the uh, London um, British Medical Society, and he wrote a textbook called, um, sorry, that's great, isn't it? Uh, his operation was on the curability of epilepsy, catalepsy, and some forms of hysteria. hysteria. Mm. And so... As a gynaecologist, he, so you could just imagine how many people in a community at any time have epilepsy. And these women in the 1860s in London and other parts of um, Great Britain were being offered removal of their clitoris to fix their hysteria, whatever that, whatever the criteria were <laughs> for that. Um, catalepsy, you know, who knew what the, diagnostic criteria for that were, and epilepsy. So he ultimately, um, you know, presumably enough people in the medical profession decided this can't be good as they watched their sisters and mothers and, and so forth go through this operation, which didn't actually resolve the problem. And uh, so he was tried by his colleagues and ultimately deregistered. But in his defence, in his hearing, he defended that, in fact, they were guarding the honour of women. You know, so the history of this organ is of removal. Even in the West, we were removing it for the most bizarre connections to other health problems, yes. you know, and and it it uh, it was quite a um, it is quite a history to to read, and thank goodness it, you know the profession did actually rise up um, and and stop it being practiced. Mind you, there are still reports in the um, Western literature of clitoridectomy being used for medical conditions outside the pelvis as late as uh, the early 20th century. So it's kind of staggering stuff. Yes. Well, hysteria, of course, was the diagnosis really for any woman who uh, gave an opinion of her own. <laughs> <laughs> you, you should know better, Caroline, yes. than to have an opinion. <laughs> yes. uh, but you've touched on that point too there because of the, the point of female genital uh, mutilation. Um, uh, in those societies which practice it now is the to protect the honor of the woman um, supposedly uh, and to guard that honor on the part of the males in her family uh, and it's done um, unfortunately on very young women um, girls often without uh, any form of anesthesia not by anybody with any medical qualifications uh, but but for that reason and so you've had this, uh, as Helen has said, this practice growing up in very different parts of the world where there's been a great fear, as it seems, of, on the part of males uh, of female sexuality. 
and thereby of female autonomy and control of their own women's control of their own bodies. Yeah, presumably if you work to understand the psyche and the cultural underpinnings of injuring a perfectly healthy organ, it does seem to have its basis in the sort of things you were alluding to. Yes. Yeah. Control over women in particular. Yes, so following the publication of your editorial in our journal um, and your writings in The Guardian, uh, you've made a podcast too that would be accessible to um, the audience. Um, so we're publishing in June a review article and another editorial about labiaplasty and the fact that it is really a form of uh, female genital mutilation. We're taking seriously the message that cosmetic surgery on the labia is not only unnecessary, it's actually criminal. Uh, and I am becoming increasingly familiar with the concept of getting clitoris, <laughs> uh, Helen, with art and science making knowledge accessible, which of course fits in nicely with the theme of the LLF conference. Yeah, getting clitoris is the rising force among girls and women to know this organ, this seat of pleasure. Though orgasm occurs in the brain, stimulation of the clitoris is the most likely path to orgasm and its benefits. The clitoris has been named physically um, for thousands of years, but it's also been maligned, ignored, or omitted even from anatomy itself. We need to restore its rightful place in female identity, life, and love. Thank you. <laughs>